I'm Stan Grant, welcome to One Plus One. Peter Cosgrove is one of those people who always seems to have been here. The soldier's soldier who became a Governor General, a man of peace, a man of war. He almost feels like someone from another time, another lost Australia. We asked Peter Cosgrove who he thinks he is and who he thinks we are as Australians. Ladies and gentlemen, I am Major General Peter Cosgrove, the commander of the International Force East Timor. His Excellency, the Governor-General. Thanks, Sir Peter Cosgrove, welcome to One Plus One. Stan, it's good to be with you. There's a question we ask at the start of this series about identity, and it is this. Who are you? I'm an Australian. Uh, I have travelled widely around the world, and when I step off an aeroplane in some other place, I think I'm an Australian, and I represent, I guess, some part of our wonderful history, and I also represent some part of our great community. And that Australianness, I think, uh, is my my overriding characteristic. What is it that defines an Australian? Can, can, can we say what an Australian is? A place that calls Australia home, whether you've just arrived and you've committed to being an Australian or whether you, your ancestry goes back 60,000 years, you live in the wide brown land and you call it home. And even those who have yet to achieve citizenship but who've made that uh, moral commitment, I count them as Australians. You mentioned in your book Dorothea McKellar's famous poem, of course, and you also point out in that something that um, a lot of people perhaps overlook or are not even aware of. She begins by talking about England and the beauty of England and she says, but that's not for me. That's exactly right, <laughs> yeah. So what is it in, you, you chose that poem and of course it's so evocative, but what is it in that that captures the essence of Australia? I think the fact that she talks about the land as if you like in, in, in what might be unfamiliar terms to a lot of people, as the totem mm. of well, our Well, it's, not, it's not, not unfamiliar to me as an Indigenous person. That is absolutely central that, to who you are. This great place with all of its amazing qualities uh, is uh, the place we, we venerate, all of us. And it is not just the geography, it's the sort of people who love the place mm. and want to live here for all of their lives. There's a beautiful um, phrase I once read by Carl Jung, the psychologist, mm. and he said, land assimilates the conqueror. Mm. I, I love that because it, it turns the idea of conquest on its head, that you go to a place and you put a flag in the ground or you conquer a people. No, no, no. The land is doing its work on you. Mm. And when you meet Australians overseas, as you have and I have, there is something, there is something you see in the eye, there is something tangible. Mm. And I, I think it's the place, I think it's the land, isn't it? I'd have to agree there that people who come here not with any kind of conqueror's instinct but come here to assert their personality end up absorbing the quality of this nation. And I was uh, with some New Zealanders uh, a couple of days ago, lived here for a number of years. Though it's talking as if with admiration and love, they've adopted this nation, even though they've kept their love of New Zealand. We have that effect on people. Mm. The boy from Pado, um, yeah. that's, that's you too, isn't it? You are that boy that grew up in Paddington and Paddington then wasn't the, uh, the, the ge ge gentrified, trendy Paddington um, in Sydney that it is now. It was, a, it was a hard scrabble, much more working class place. How much of the the boy from Paddo is still here in front of me. I think the exuberance of it being a young boy in Paddo where you had your little gang of genteel urchins, as I've described them elsewhere, uh, and they were all fellows around the same age, you would wander the streets and you would be very familiar with the sights and sounds of that ancient, well, in the, the time since European settlement, it was one of the early suburbs, 
And in coming up, it was always for the working class. Mm. And then as people got more affluent and bought places elsewhere, the people who stayed in Paddington were blue collar. And it was just a different sen a sense of community cohesion. The place was full of men and women who'd served in World War II when yeah, I was yeah, a lad. Your, your, your father and, and grandfather That's are right. examples of this. And the person next door and then a couple of doors up, the, the street was full of returned men and women who'd been in their country's uniform. And that gave it an extra dimension of cohesion. What you're describing there too is, is interesting to me because I, I, have this, I have this memory of, of, a, of an older Australia, mm. you know, the, the Chico Rolls and the, yep. and the, and the fish and chips yep. and the, you know, that Australia was a very different Australia. We look back at that rose-coloured glasses, I suppose. They were tough times in many respects as well. But do you reflect on that, Australia and what it was then and how it's changed? I think most of Australia was still inward looking, re remembering that we were recovering uh, after mm. two wars within 50 years. A depression. That's, that's it. And we uh, had a generation of people who'd breathed a huge sigh of relief at the conclusion of the war in the Pacific, the end of World War II, and were concentrating with getting on and hopefully uh, seeing a boom in jobs, uh, income, uh, productivity, quality of life in Australia, all classes of people. We were welcoming the influx of people from Europe, some from it was Asia. It was just starting to happen. It was still a, a, an overwhelmingly white country, it was. wasn't it? Yep. Um, and, and you saw that change, didn't you? And you saw the way that people accommodated yep. that change. Not, not, not always comfortably either. There's a bit of grit in that oyster, isn't there? There was. Uh, there was, however, a sense of, well, this is the new Australia. Mm. And I think quite quickly when you look back over the uh, history of the nation, we got over the issue of who are the newcomers. Well, remember they used to use that phrase, new Australians? Yes. Remember the migrants were called the, the, the new Australians. A exactly right. And this is the time when the white Australia policy yeah. was consigned to the dustbin. Uh, and in, in all of that, I think you saw this sense of perhaps unease, but remorseless direction towards, well, we're going to be more embracing of the community. You know, I think about that time and I remember, remember that film, They're a Weird Mob? Absolutely, yep. And this, after five, what it means? Planes ring them after five o'clock. Oh, thank you. Uh, you are builder's labour? No, I'm not, but I can try to be. You know, it's written here, experience not necessary. You're not right in the score. But what it, what it means... Oh, uh, look, Spot, get lost, will you? Where? Get to tell you it really where? captured something for me because, look, you know, it's confronting and some of the language by today's standards was pretty raw. Yeah. You know, the words that we use to describe people. Yep. But was there something in the, in the humour that allowed people to find each other despite those differences? I think it must have been very confronting for somebody newly into Australia uh, to hear some of the throwaway terms. Mm. The most polite of which, and I won't use any of the others, was a refo. Mm. Well, that meant you're a refugee. You may have been, you may be a, have been a, a, a very well-credentialed, deliberate migrant bringing enormous skill into Australia, but the soubriquet for you was refo. Mm. Now, often though, that was said in a humorous way to the extent of uh, when you became friends with workmates, who may be using that sort of term towards you, uh, the badinage would go backwards and forwards and they'd realise you're also a good bloke. Have, have we lost some of that? I mean, I, you know, uh, it, it, these days, of course, we are so much more aware of the power of words and, and how words are hurtful and how people are stereotyped. Do you lose something in the way that people get along? I, I, is, it, is it more difficult today? Uh, Australian society has evolved in, in company with many nations uh, in the world. And we are now much more uh, sensitive mm. about offending people. And rightly, yeah. Yeah. So I think, uh, I don't think we've lost anything. I think what we have gained, though, is a sensitivity to creating offence. Mm. If you are to be welcoming, then don't have a layer of judgement that precedes your encounter with people. So, Peter, so what was it that, that 
led you to the army? I know your family had had a history and you spoke so, so uh, fondly about growing up around return service, but what was it that led you to join up? Well, I did consider a range of other uh, careers because uh, I wanted something that was to do with people. I, I thought of being a, a teacher, uh, a lawyer, a policeman, a journalist. Uh, I was, and, and, and also the army. And because the uh, Defence Force, the army in particular, was uh, still on military operations, warlike operations, and I knew a bit more about that because my dad was still in the army and my granddad had been in the army. Mm. It was sort of just seeping into me. They weren't saying, neither of them, and certainly not my mum, I joined the army, but it was just by osmosis. You were at that hinge point of history, I think, as well. You talk about that Australia post-war and post-depression and people were so relieved and there was that energy, I think, post-war energy. The yep. economy was booming. There was a, a baby boom. They're yep. having a lot more children. Yep. Um, and then come the late 60s and into the 70s in Vietnam. And I, I look at Vietnam as a, as I say, a real hinge point in that history. Um, it was a tumultuous time, protest on the street. Ultimately, you see in 1972, the end of conservative government, the election of the Whitlam government. It was a process of change and you were right there at the heart of it. What was it like? As a young officer, as I was, well, trainee first of all, then a young officer, and off into uh, Malaysia for a few months, and then a year in Vietnam. In all of that, uh, a couple of big impressions. I got to love Asia, even uh, Vietnam. The dangerous part was just that it was a war, but I thought, this is a fascinating place. So on the one side, a lot of growing up on my part and getting to know uh, vastly different other cultures. Back here in Australia, I think people were entitled to ask the big questions about why are we in Vietnam and what's happening there. Where our immaturity shone through was that we visited uh, those concerns on the soldiers. I, I, I look at that and you see the seeds of, I think, the world that we're living in now where Broadly, you could say that the West, and particularly the place of America in the world, is, is uncertain. Yep. Um, there is a rise of China, and that is tilting the balance of, of power. And, of course, China represents a, an authoritarian form of government that, that does not reflect the values of a, a liberal democracy. Do you see that the seeds of that sown in that period, that the, the damage that was perhaps done to American prestige and America's place in the world start to be really questioned after that? I think that was the first time where people said uh, that the United States itself is not unilaterally, uh, comprehensively behind uh, the Allies' involvement in Vietnam. The difference for me between then and now is that the Australian population is extraordinarily literate and interested in public affairs, national affairs, international affairs. And through that, we're a very discriminating uh, population. Mm. We look at what we see and we don't accept that there's just one story being told by this one or that one. Uh, we're a very inquiring population. And that's where I think we probably are asking questions which may not have been asked in the earlier part, well, post-World War II, uh, part of our modern history. So much of your, um, your career and your career in the military um, spans that awakening, as you say, you know, people becoming more aware of our place in the world. And Timor was really fundamental. It transformed your life. You became a, a household name and a, a, such a, a familiar face and it led to other things in your career. How do you reflect on, on that period with East Timor? Because um, it was also a, a, a period of after a great deal of soul searching and there was criticism and there was a whole lot of things caught up with that as well. But for you, how do you remember that? Well, I remember it as a, a, a people that had been uh, under colonial rule since Europeans arrived on their shores hundreds of years ago and in 1975 just exchanged one colonial uh, mm. master for another. That, that was in their, their view and just leapt at the chance to express their desire for independence. It was an historical moment and we were just lucky to be, if you like, 
stewards of that transition. Now, so were the United Nations, so were the uh, NGOs and others, so were the private or non-government organisations that supported independence. So there are lots of, if you like, um, I suppose, uh, maternity uh, agents there, you know, midwives. Uh, we were just the military midwife and we were lucky and I got to see uh, a people achieve independence. So, Peter, we, we've, we've talked about your career, we've talked about the military and the way that that's shaped Australia and those conflicts that have shaped Australia. And I, I want to talk about how that feeds into our national identity um, and the role of Anzac Day. Uh, I would say, in, in some respects, Anzac Day speaks to us in a ways that even Australia Day doesn't. We know that there is... There is great angst around Australia Day, particularly from Indigenous communities um, and others who, who also share those concerns about what it represents. But Anzac Day has taken on such a solemnity. People approach that in different ways and you know, as an Indigenous person, I can stand there and remember my grandfather as a, an Indigenous rat of Tabrook, Tabrook and his brother who died in the fields of France and my cousin who serves in the military today. Is Anzac Day really, a, in, in a way, our Australia Day? Anzac Day is one of the great days in Australia. I mean, there's the conventional holidays. There's Australia Day, which, you know, uh, celebrates a date. And in some cases, uh, it, it actually mourns. For some, they mourn the date. Mm. Um, we've got to find a way to knit those together so we can have great respect uh, to note a, a milestone in the modern history of Australia because the ancient history of Australia uh, belongs uh, wholly and solely to First Australians. Uh, and we, we should embrace that, bring it forward and do what we can to understand that. Uh, so Australia Day will park for a moment. Anzac Day is, uh, has no arguments that it, it is for all Australians to say on this national day, uh, we talk about the Australia that expressed itself in the international arena through the terrible crucible of wars, but it said, we care, we count, we will help. Mm. And yet, even on Anzac Day, we, we, we define ourselves and we see ourselves through those conflicts. As I say, Indigenous people have proudly served in, in all of those conflicts, but there's still the question of frontier wars. Could you see a frontier war or recognition of the battles that took place on this land um, as part of that commemoration? It's, it's a hard one because uh, it's something that I think has to arrive. Uh, I would rather that the, uh, the events that we do on Australia Day take into account not just the meeting of the... Uh, arriving cultures with the ancient first cultures, but the, the friction that led up to uh, the end of what might be called internal conflict. So that doesn't mean that the end of uh, that reported conflict uh, is the end of the struggle. Mm. Far from it. We still need to recognise but, but, that. But do you think that's more appropriate incorporated into, a, into a, an Australia Day remembrance, commemoration, whatever people want to call it, celebration, than it is as part of Anzac Day? Anzac Day, because it contains New Zealand, mm -hmm. uh, springs from a certain memory, uh, would probably say that was not done on our shores. Mm -hmm. There was no Anzac until it was uh, perpetrated mm -hmm. in Gallipoli. Mm -hmm. And from that point on, it became emblematic in both nations to that expression of uh, international authenticity. Uh, it's chosen because it's not that we had a good speech in the League of Nations mm. or we had a particularly fine High Commissioner in London. It speaks about uh, the fact that no greater expression of a nation's um, a involvement in defending other people's 
values uh, it can be done than to send your men or women. And, and, and from that point of view, I think we say uh, that ANZAC title stops at our shores, but that doesn't overlook the, uh, the chilling episodes that occurred mm. uh, within, our, within our shores. Is it also walking a fine line when you see something like this? And I know you'd be very alive to this as well as being a military man, that something that, um, that comes from, from war, that's something that defines us, that we commemorate or we, you know, we, we solemnify on that day, um, can also be hijacked for nationalism. That line between what is patriotic and what is nationalistic. Yeah. Do you think we walk that line successfully in Australia? I think we do, but I mean, like any fine line, you occasionally cross over. The number of uh, episodes, just, just in our lifetimes, casual episodes where people would say, I'm a patriot, and you say, no, you're an idiot, uh, because what you're doing uh, is not patriotic because our patriots value every last person mm. on our shores and they value the rule of law and they value standards and they should value uh, the cohesion of our community. But what you're doing is trying to hijack the, the role of the patriot. We're pretty good at separating it out. And as I said, uh, the person who hides behind uh, patriotism might be perpetuating idiocy. It must have been a remarkable thing when the boy from Paddo um, becomes Governor General. There's a wonderful moment in the book where you talk about Tony Abbott calling you up, oh, essentially yeah. to offer you the job. And in this incredibly sort of laconic Australian way, you go, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll give you a call back tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. That's yeah. not a job you say I'll think about. <laughs> well, I, as I described, I had a work colleague in the yeah, car with me and a hire car driver. You didn't want to give it away. And if I had said, g'day, Prime Minister, <laughs> this bloke with ears like a bat would have said, aha. I love what you said. You picked up the phone, you went, g'day. <laughs> <laughs> well, it came up as, you know, Tony, Tony Abbott. Abbott, yeah. And I, yeah. So I had to explain in the next call, the next day, <laughs> look, this was, this was why I was so flippant on the phone. <laughs> It is a hell of a thing to say, though. Someone calls you up and says, do you want to be Governor-General? And you say, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll call you back tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I'll check my diary. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, it also um, goes to that Australia and, and, and what we see as leadership in Australia. We've had Quentin Bryce, of course. Um, do you think we're, we're going to see that role change as well? It's move away from the, you know, I, I hate to put you in this category, but the, the old white men category, and, and see that as reflecting the change in our society when we start to see more diversity in roles like that? Look, if uh, it was Governor-General going forward for the next 50 years or at some stage we became a Republican, that person was called a president, the only qualification they have beyond their personal attributes by convention, which is as strong as any sort of law, if you like, they, the, the head of state or de facto head of state, state for Australia will be an Australian. Mm. Now, that's the only qualification and uh, they can and be... And people of all backgrounds and yeah, they male, must, female. Yeah. They must have good character. They must be acceptable to the people. It would be lovely if they had uh, some kind of a uh, public uh, profile already uh, and they must be able to communicate. Uh, uh, they, they must respect and know about our constitution and be prepared to act upon it. So once you put all those together, there's a large field, certainly bigger than a Melbourne Cup field, and any time of who would make a very admirable Governor General. On the question of, of a republic, should we become one? Do you have a political view or a preference? I have a, not a political view, and, and I'm certainly quite content that the Governor-General uh, has the wisdom of the writers of the Constitution to circumscribe, circumscribe and guide that person's duties and they're appropriate. What I'm unclear about, in fact I'm opposed to it, is a President who carries his or her own set of powers. So the, elected president by the people with a mandate, you'd be well, concerned Well, I don't that. think a president with a mandate will help our uh, the strength of our system. No. I would be very relaxed if we stayed with a governor general or we achieved a president which retained the primacy 
of parliamentary government. But like the rest of us, if it's put to a vote, you only get one. <laughs> yes, yes. Or, yes or no. <laughs> well, I didn't get to vote in the uh, Republic debate in 99 or the yeah. referendum in 99. I was so intent on ensuring that all the soldiers, everybody in Timor, uh, got a vote that by the time the polls closed, I hadn't voted. Missed... <laughs> I haven't got a fine yet. So that's, a, that's a get out of jail free card. But but you got you got a choice here. You can say yes, the Republic, no. That's that's the vote. Which way? Which box do you tick? I want to see the model. I won't say yes or no because I need to see the model that was produced. I'm in favour of a strong parliamentary government. Warts and all, it has served the Federation and the states very well. Just finally, I mean, there's been a remarkable life and uh, the boy from Pato to become a general, to become, you know, the, the, the Governor General. Uh, and, and we started and I asked you who you were and you're an Australian. Now you look at your life and you look at all of those things, what is the thing you're most proud of? Well, you add them up along the way. I was very proud when I found out uh, on operations in Vietnam that I could do this job as a young officer. And then later on when I had various commands, I loved the idea of command and I really loved those men and then men and women who were entrusted to me. Uh, and then to be there when East Timor was born, so to speak, there, as an independent nation, that was, I thought, well, that'll take some beating. The other senior military jobs were fabulous. That only leaves two things. The Governor General job, the highlight, the privilege, the honour of my public life. But the other one, all the way along the way for the last 44 years, uh, wife. I knew you were going to say, Lynn, because it's, it's, yep. it's such a, a love story yep. and such a, a partnership yep. um, and such strength. You, you, reading the book, it is, it is all the way through the book, the strength of that family relationship. She is a champion. Uh, we have this saying in the military when people get tough jobs and they, they're in a stable relationship. We admire that by saying, buy one, get one free. <laughs> and the Commonwealth of Australia got me and they got one free in this marvellous woman. Yeah, fantastic. So, Peter, an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Thanks for talking to One Plus One. Thank you very much indeed, Stan. It's been wonderful to be with you.